had experienced that service as variously in much of the work. Since 1981, she has taught in the English department of the Newark campus of Rutgers University, and has also taught courses in literature and writing at Columbia and Princeton, as well as serving on the poetry faculty of the Sewanee Writers Conference and the Westchester Poetry Conference. She has received a Guggenheim Fellowship in Poetry, an Ingram Merrill Foundation grant in Poetry, and an award in Literature for the American Academy and Institute of Arts and Letters. About her work, the poet Grace Shulman has written, the poems are urgent, contemplative, and finely wrought. In them, antiquity illuminates the present, as Rachel Hollis finds in ordinary human acts what never was and what is usual, what is eternal, sorry. You will find most of her works in our collection here. There's a small display in the front. Um, as well as works by Gardner Fall and Patty Oliver Smith, although uh, this guy's book is out. Um, copies of the Letters of Their Mothers are out. So if you don't see them there, it's because they're out. That's for the library, that's good for us. Um, please welcome Rachel Hawks. and continuities of my life. And this building uh, is sort of a metonymy or synecdoche for St. Johnsbury. It is St. Johnsbury in many ways. And the painting is a metonymy of the building. And thanks to Bob, the painting has been beautifully restored and returned. So I think we should all give Bob a hand. And the managed to get books by all of us in display in front. And Reed, can I just hold up this book a second? Well, this will be for sale afterwards. This is the anthology we'll be reading from. It is a strange little book, and I'll talk about it for a minute. Then I will briefly introduce the other readers. Thanks. Um, and we're all going to try to read for no more than 12 or 15 minutes each, but we'll, we'll do the best we can here. So I was um, asked in the spring of 17, if I might want to contribute a, an essay to an anthology called Writers and Their Mothers, and I immediately gathered in my wonderful friends, Patty, Reeve, and Gardner. Another friend of mine, Adrienne Kalfopoulou, has a chapter in the book about Sylvia Platt and her mother. It's a strange book, partly because it is a transatlantic book. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, and a lot of the essays in it are by English writers about English writers and their mothers. And most of those writers are men, strangely enough. The, the, the mothers tend to be women, but writers are all men. And um, most of the reviews, which have been good, on, on the other side of the ocean have definitely focused on those British writers, Kingsley Amos and his stepmother, Philip Larkin, and his mother, William Golding, and his mother. And they tended to leave us out. So this is not necessarily a problem. It's just that the book is going to change depending on what you read. And I'm delighted by the, the four of us being able to be here. Um, let me introduce in order of the readers who will come after me. Gardner McFall is a poet and opera librettist. And she has, uh, one of her, her opera libretto, Amelia, is on the table out there. And she has three beautiful poems in a brand new anthology also on the table called Inheriting the War, poems by descendants of Vietnam veterans and refugees, if I have that right. And um, Gardner is a neighbor in New York, so we get to meet and debrief quite regularly about the poetry world. Um, Patty Oliver Smith, who lives up in Albany, Vermont, is somebody I've known for many years, and she has a beautiful memoir of her grandmother called Martha's Mandala, and she's working on a memoir of her mother, and she'll be reading about her mother. Patty has taught high school and college in many, many states. I won't name them all. Um, and Reeve Lindbergh, most of you know, and she's um, a wonderful memoirist, essayist, citizen, and human being. And because she's already written a good deal about her mother, she chose an interesting, I thought, way to triangulate by writing about her mother's friends. Female friendships are really important, and they were a generation ago as well. Patty reminded me um, an hour ago to say what's pretty obvious. We're all quite, quite near the same age, the four of us, and we're all from pretty similar backgrounds. 
and that means we have an incomplete view, but we have an interesting take on what life was like maybe in the 1950s, for example. Uh, Gardner, however, will, will be reading about Louisa May Alcott and her mother, so that's, that's a little further back than that. So I want to say um, a little bit before launching into my very abbreviated version of my essay, um, every mother-child dyad is unique. Even within one family, every family, every child grows up in a different family, as we all know. Some mothers die giving birth, others live to be 104. Um, the essay collection that we're celebrating gives some sense of this range of experience, although obviously only a partial sense. And I can only speak for myself. I would hesitate to make any generalizations. But as I look back on a mother who has been gone for more than a quarter of a century, I find that there are three questions in my mind. Um, who was my mother before she became my mother? It's very easy for all of us in our innocent narcissism to assume that the most important thing our mother ever did was give birth to us and then raise us. What else could she have done? Um, so that's one question. Who was she before we arrived? Maybe writers are even more narcissistic than other people. I don't know. It's entirely possible. Secondly, what kind of mother was she? What was the relationship like while one was growing up? And thirdly, um, especially if our mothers are gone, what does my mother mean to me now that I look back, now that I myself am approaching the age at which my mother was when she died? Um, as I take stock now, what do I see? None of these questions is easy to answer. How do you ever manage to see your own mother? Um, a poet I admire, Erica Funkhauser, wrote in a recent collection, you know, poets lean very hard on figurative language, a language, I love this, it helps me to understand my mother if I think of her as an event that took place in distant space. And because its waves could travel unimpeded by matter, has finally brought its bird song to earth. <laughs> Trying to figure out from the distance. I've tried to edit my essay down, but even if it's the right length, it is not possible to answer these questions directly or in a linear fashion, but I hope that what I will read will speak to some of these, who was my mother before I arrived, what kind of mother was she, and what do I see now? Who was my mother? I'll quote two paragraphs from my sister Beth's afterward to Ferdinandus Torres. <laughs> Excuse me. In 1964, my mother translated the children's classic Ferdinand the Bull into Latin. <laughs> um, and the title of my essay, Mater Sagax, Wise Mother, is from that translation. I'll get back to that later. Elizabeth Chamberlain Harris, 1915 to 1992, was a teacher, a reader, a translator, a mother. This is my sister writing. Those activities were not separate parts of, our, of her life. She was the most bookish person I had ever known. My sister was an editor, so that was saying a lot. <laughs> Um, she read aloud to Rachel and me long before we could possibly understand what she was reading to us, and it is not an accident that both of us have devoted our lives to books, one of us as an author and the other as a publisher. Elizabeth was brought up to teach. Her father, Louis Chamberlain, a professor of classics, died when she was two years old. Faced with raising two daughters, her mother taught at St. Richmond's School, a St. Catherine's School, excuse me, in Richmond, Virginia, and when, my, when our mother grew up, she went on to teach at various girls' schools as well. Um, eventually, writes my sister, she developed an interest in seeing the world beyond girls' schools. She moved to New York, married Moses Hattis, a classicist, as her father had been, had two daughters, and taught at Spence, another girls' school, and spent the rest of her career there. These, uh, my sister covers the main points crisply. Her very concision, of course, means that much has been elided, and I, I can't fill that in now. But it is possible to see the 21 years of my mother's marriage to my father as a kind of island in the middle of various girls' schools. She also put in two stints as a librarian, one at the Library of Congress and one at the New York Public Library. Books, books, books. When she retired from Spence in New York in 1984, 
my mother became a pretty much full-time grandmother to my son, Jonathan, who had been born earlier that year. She died when he was eight years old. What does he remember? He writes, my memories of Lizzie are sparse. He has memories of her feeding him pancakes in the house in Vermont, and particularly of her reading to him. The feeding and the reading ring a bell here, and he remembered particular books, The Hobbit, the chapter about Bayorn in The Hobbit, for example, um, and many other books. My own grandmother, who died when I was maybe 10 or younger, uh, my only memory of her is her reading me The Owl and the Pussycat. When I think of my mother and my son together, I think of her carrying him as a baby around the garden in Vermont, naming the flowers, or carrying him down the road. He ruffled her white hair, Anna's hair, he said, or touching her glasses, Anna's asses. <laughs> uh, when she was carrying him down the long hall of our New York apartment, he looked up at the light fixture over her shoulder and said, I think, his first word, Eit, Eit. He inherited my mother's flawless spelling, love of gardening, and the family love of books. My mother was primarily a reader of books, not a writer. After translating Ferdinand the Bull, she planned to translate some of Aesop's fables into Latin with graduated difficulty to serve as text for Latin students, but I think my father's death interrupted that project. Earlier in 1960, she edited The Life of Christ, a very rich little book of the gospel story as represented by Renaissance painters. It should have been a coffee table book, but it's a tiny little paperback published by Library of America, now quite hard to get hold of. Given the right prompt and within her range of subject matter, my mother was extremely knowledgeable. She always seemed to know the answer to every question whether it was about literature or not. Of course, maybe not sports, maybe not mathematics, but in the range of humanities, mystery, and just how to behave as a human being, she knew. And my sister, who uh, wants to be a Jeopardy champion, is also very interested in answering questions. My mother would have been very good at that, too. When I did a lot of, uh, a little um, superficial research in writing this and asked a very few friends their memories of my mother, the sense that she always knew the answer would come up again and again. In Ferdinand the Bull, in Latin, quod era mater sagax et si waka, she was a wise mother, although she was a cow. <laughs> <laughs> and sagax gives us the word sagacious, and that word comes up as well. Uh, my mother's talent for giving a child, particularly a girl, the right book at the right time struck me as, even then, as sort of uncanny. She gave me poetry anthologies that were very formative in my life when I was 11 or 12. She may have known that I wanted to be a poet. She certainly knew I liked poetry, but the main thing was these were books that she had liked, and she passed them on to me. Robert Frost says in The Figure a Poem Makes, the figure is the same as for love. You are able to give something, pass it on, maybe to a child or a grandchild, and keep it at the same time. Elizabeth excelled at giving books or answering questions, but she rarely volunteered opinions or information unless she was asked. That is a very rare human quality, isn't it? <laughs> to know to keep your mouth shut. Um, it, it strikes me more and more the older I get. It's very unusual. But I have two quick vignettes of questions I asked her as a child that she answered, and they were not easy questions to answer. In both cases, I've been overhearing her talking on the phone. Remember telephones? Um, and I would hear her side of the conversation and one time she was making an excuse not to attend a social gathering that she and my father had been invited to. And I think I was always around listening. Mommy, mommy, what are you doing Friday night? I didn't know you were busy. And my mother paused and said, honey, it was a social lie. <laughs> and a much harder question, she was talking to my uncle on the phone about her sister, my aunt, and clearly something had gone wrong. Mommy, mommy, what happened to Aunt Mary? And my mother paused a beat and said, she hanged herself. I was maybe 13, but
But I took for granted that she was telling me the truth and would tell me the truth. And the honesty, the clarity, the concision, those are three excellent Latin words, by the way. Honesty, clarity, concision are my mother. Um, she didn't say much about feelings when her sister Mary died or significantly when my father died. Uh, she lived on for 26 years, which must often have been lonely, but she enjoyed friends, family. Um, but a lot of my memories of her are connected to texts, and it's come back to me as I approach the end of this little chapter here that soon after my father died, I was 17, she sent me a quote from the Latin historian, the Roman historian Tacitus, which had meant a lot to her. And it, it was very helpful to me. Um, and I'm struck all these years later by three things. Number one, my mother was in need of consolation herself, but she offered consolation to me. Again, that sort of triangulation. Secondly, how many mothers send passages from Roman historians to their 17-year-old daughters? And thirdly, the passage she sent, of which I'll leave you a little of, was just as applicable, if not more so, to herself, to my mother, as to my father. It's about how to mourn a respected elder in the right way. As I reach the age of 70, I have much more in common with my mother in her later years than I do with the 17-year-old I used to be. Tacitus writes, and I'm adjusting for gender a little bit, if there is any mention for the spirits of the just, if great souls do not perish with the body, then quiet, O oh mother, be your rest. May you call us your household from feeble regrets and weak mourning to contemplate your virtues, in the presence of which sorrow and lamentation become a sin. May we honor you in better ways, by admiration and praise, even by following your example. That is the true honor, the true affection of souls knit close to yours. The image of the human face, like that face itself, is feeble and perishable, whereas the essence of the soul is eternal, never to be caught and expressed by the material and skill of a stranger, but only by you in your own living. When I began to feel I was coming into my own as a poet, I sometimes had the sense that the familiarity with and love of literature that my mother passed on to me was like some excellent ingredients which she had given me and I cooked them. She gave them to me raw and I cooked them. And that, of course, is nonsense. It's very pretentious and presumptuous. The essential qualities of her soul were not raw ingredients. They'd just been recombined in a different form I do things she didn't do, she did things I don't do. But I, I sense her presence more and more. And I'll just end by a snippet of a poem I wrote soon after her death, um, called The Double Legacy. I particularly like Tacitus's reminder that people's faces vanish, and what we are able to keep is something more intangible but more permanent. As for my mother's legacy, it can't be told as quantity piled up or counted or assessed. If right this moment I should divest myself of all that can be seen in what she left me, there remain hours upon hours of gentleness, her reading voice's calm caress, the realm of books she opened to my young attention as I grew, and let me roam them safe and free, with the whole world for company of voices I can always hear whenever no one else is near, or when I'm reading to my son, and so can hand affection on in the same shape as what I took so happily from her, the book. And thank you.
is that um, Ava Alcott was absolutely crucial to Louisa May Alcott in terms of her realizing her girlhood dream of becoming a writer. So, and fortunately, Ava lived long enough to see the success of her daughter and the success of Little Women, which this year we celebrate the 150th anniversary of. Um, and Louise May Alcott at the time of her death was perhaps the most popular writer working in our country. She had sold 36,000 copies of um, Little Women, which is quite a number of books. This section is, focuses a lot on Ava, her mother. Every daughter intimately knows the abiding power of her mother. She thrives on her praise and can wither under her censoring eye. Nancy Friday has written in My Mother Myself, the daughter's search for identity. My mother was my first and most lasting model. Whatever else happens to us in relationships to fathers, peers, teachers, the tie to the mother is the one constant, a kind of lens through which all that follows is seen. Born to Dorothy Sewell May and Colonel Joseph May, Abba grew up in a liberal, aristocratic Boston family that valued moral virtue and education. According to Sanford Saylor's early biography of Abigail May Alcott, um, her mother was a power behind the scenes, a gentle, pervading influence. She knew how to get inside the minds of her children, studied their failings and possibilities, and guided them with a calm wisdom. Two of Abba's favorite maxims were, love your duty and you will be happy, and cope and keep busy, an instruction she tucked in Louise's journal in 1845 and which the March sisters adopt in their motto, as their motto in a moment of family crisis and little women. Duty, industry, and generosity, bordering on self-denial, were three gender-specific virtues Abba learned in her own home and later communicated to her daughters. Compared to her older, beloved sister, Louisa May Griel, for whom Louisa May Alcott was named, Abba was, in Sailor's words, strong, forceful, moody, and impulsive. Louisa inherited her mother's character traits as well as her dark eyes and hair. According to Eve LaPlante in Marmy and Louisa, the untold story of Louisa May Alcott, she had a childhood memory of being told she was the spirit and image of her mother. Her father Bronson noted that the elements of their beings are similar. The will is the predominating power. Quick-tempered, they both struggle to control their anger, a bond they share. Marmy counsels Joe about this in Little Women. I am angry nearly every day of my life, Joe, but I have learned not to show it, and I still hope to learn not to feel it, though it may take me another 40 years to do so. In giving Marmy these words, Alcott expressed not just the condition of women then, but what it continues to be in modern times, as articulated by Friday. We bear a burden of anger all our lives. Society would rather we always wore a pretty face. Women have been trained to cut off anger. Although Abba was unable to attend Harvard like her brother, Samuel Joseph, she borrowed his books and absorbed the ideas he brought home. Like him, she grew to be a women's rights activist and abolitionist, who with her husband Bronson sheltered runaway slaves. She was a woman ahead of her time, headstrong and intelligent, a natural storyteller. She once had aspirations of becoming a writer and certainly continued writing poems as an adult. Louisa reported in her journal on Christmas 1843, the piece of poetry which mother wrote for me. Abba defied her father's wish that she marry a cousin, preferring to wait and marry, if ever, for love. And so she did. She had her 20s to explore her place in the world, not rather than being tied to domestic duties as a wife. Her ambitions prompted her in 1819 to tell her parents, I'm not willing to be found incapable of anything. She said, quotes LaPlante, that no woman's intelligence should be trammeled and attenuated by custom as her body is by fashion. Abba's will and fervor regarding women's worth and independence informed her ability over many years to shoulder the family's financial burdens. The man she married, Bronson Alcott, a friend of Emerson and Thoreau, implemented his progressive views of education at Boston's Temple School, which Louisa att attended from ages three to seven until the school closed. But he was incapable of providing for his family as men were expected to at the time. Insolvency and transience marked Louisa's childhood. While Bronson fostered an intellectual atmosphere at home when he was there, and apparently was a brilliant conversationalist abroad, he held very conventional views of how girls should behave, and criticized Louisa for being undisciplined and willful. 
He much preferred Louisa's older sister, Anna, who was blonde, sweet-tempered, and docile, who wrote about others in her journal, not about herself, leaving home at key junctures in Louisa's life to travel to England for a year and a half when she was eight, or just take a room apart from the family in order to read and think, which she did for 18 months during her infancy. It fell to Abba to shoulder the duties of parenting and breadwinning alone. Over the years, even Anna and Louisa worked to support the family, taking in sewing and, and teaching to supplement Abba's income, derived at different times from having boarders in her home, performing social work, and making requests for money to her brother. In her mother, Louisa saw a powerful figure capable of acting independently of a man, indeed standing in a man's position by way of supporting the household, and at critical points when Louisa's voice might have been silenced by cultural mores and values, in the way Carol Gilligan, in A Different Voice, and Mary Pfeiffer, reviving Ophelia, have cogently examined concerning girls' development today, Abba gave Louisa the unwavering encouragement to follow her inclinations and talent. Friday quotes child psychiatrist Dr. Sergei Sanger, quote, there's a certain growth period from five to 10 when little girls' passivity and underachievement is too often accepted as normal. The ages five to 10 were central to Louisa's development. In Recollections of My Childhood, where she refers to herself as a tomboy, she credits her mother with giving her a sense of freedom by allowing her to run freely outside and learning of nature what no books can teach. I remember running over the hills just at dawn one summer morning and pausing to rest in the silent woods and saw through an arch of trees the sun rise over the hill and wide green meadows as I never saw before. Madeline B. Stern reveals that when she was eight, Louisa wrote a two-line rhyming stanza entitled To the First Robin, and when she presented it to her mother, she responded, you will grow up as Shakespeare. She preserved the poem and urged Louisa to keep writing. Although all the members of the Alcott family had journals, Alba especially encouraged Louisa to write about her life there. She often left notes in her journal for her to read, telling her in one note to make observations about our conversations and your own thoughts. It helps you to express them. In her book, the Al in the book, The Alcott's Biography of a Family, Madeline Bedell notes that Abba wrote her brother, I encourage her writing, it is a safety valve to her smothered sorrow, which might otherwise consume her young and tender heart. Bedell suggests that Abba may have been speaking from her own smothered sorrows. In any event, she understood that Louisa channeled her emotions into her writing and that she was happy when immersed in imaginative work. Nothing is so valuable to a child trying to understand her place in the world as having her mother's attention and praise. And this matters to both sexes, of course, but it's especially true for girls who, by virtue of being female, understand themselves in relation to the world through her. The mother serves as a model to imitate or reject. She demonstrates what's possible or what to avoid. Evidently, Alice's favorite, favorable response to her poem motivated Louisa to continue writing. And when she was 10, she records in her journal giving her mother a moss cross and a piece of poetry for her birthday. Urging Louisa on, Abba presented Louisa with a pencil case on her 10th birthday with a note, Dear daughter, I give you this pencil case, I promise, for I've observed you're fond of writing and wish to encourage the habit. Such acceptance from her mother, combined with permission to pursue her talent, informed Louisa's early sense of herself, as well as her ambition, which was large. In 1843, she put in her journal, she wanted to be as uh, famous as Jenny Lind, but of course she became more famous, I think. <laughs> Abba's, Abba's views must have counterbalanced the social tutelage she was receiving from her father and his friend, the English transcendentalist Charles Lane, um, who conceived, who convinced Bronson that he should move his family to a commune named Fruitlands during the family's unhappy years from 1843 to 45. In January 1845, Louisa was 12. She wrote in her journal some of her lessons. And among the virtues she was striving for in her list were <coughs> silence and self-denial, typical female um, attributes. The vices she wished to surmount included activity and willfulness. Clearly, traits considered undesirable in a girl. In her book, In a Different Voice, Psycholo Psychological Theory in Women's Development, Carol Gilligan says, the notion that virtue for women lies in self-sacrifice has complicated the course of women's development by pitting the moral issue of goodness against the adult questions of responsibility and choice. In Reviving Ophelia, Saving the Lives of Adolescent Girls, Mary Pfeiffer writes, girls have long been trained to be feminine at considerable cost to their humanity. 
They have they've long been evaluated on the basis of appearance and caught in myriad double lines. Achieve but not too much. Be polite but be yourself. Be feminine and adult. Be aware of our cultural heritage but don't comment on the sexism. Another way to describe this feminine training is to call it false self-training. Girls are trained to be less than who they really are. They're trained to be what the culture wants of its young women, not what they themselves want to become. If this restrictive socialization is true today, Louisa's triumph over the more rigid rules governing girls in the 19th century is all the more remarkable, let's say a miracle. She managed to yoke female sacrifice or duty to her goal of becoming a writer. If she could earn money from her writing to take care of her family, she could fulfill her duty as a daughter and her wish for her independent self simultaneously. These twin impulses were arguably fueled in part by well-channeled anger. Aware of her family's relentless poverty, she wrote in Recollections of My Childhood that as a girl, she'd shaken her fist at fate embodied in a crow cawing dismally on the fence nearby. I will do something by and by, don't care what. Teach, sew, act, write, anything to help the family, and I'll be rich and famous and happy before I die. Louisa knew who knew whom she could count on, writing in her journal at 13. People think I'm wild and queer, but Mother understands and helps me. At 17, I can't talk to anyone but Mother about my troubles. Discovering an encouraging note from Abba in her journal, she also wrote, I wish someone would write as helpfully to her, for she needs cheering up with all the care she has. I often think what a hard life she has had since she married, so full of wandering and all sorts of worry. I think she is very brave and a good woman, and my dream is to have a lovely, quiet home for her with no debts or troubles to burden her. Thank you.
She turns away from her typewriter, taking a moment to focus on the scrap of line notebook paper I thrust at her. Taking it, she stares at my works as if looking at a map of the ancient world written in lunatic script. When her eyes focus, she reads quickly while I wait for her praise. She looks at me, shakes her head a little, and says in the unwavering British accent she acquired in her days as an actress, Patty Darling never used the word cerulean in a poem about the sky. Except for that rhythmic blue word, I don't remember anything else about the sky poem, which I immediately lost or threw away. Decades later, however, I clearly remember my mother at her desk typing, completely absorbed. On a particular afternoon, I imagine that she is working on one of her novels that it took me until just a few years ago to read. She sits upright, her slender fingers poised on the typewriter keys. In her stillness, she stares at a half page of print backed by carbon paper in the roller. I say her name three times, at first softly, then almost shouting, Mom! Mm -hmm. She turns to look at me for some minutes. I have been standing patiently right next to her. But she hasn't even sensed my presence, let alone seen me. Despite the urgency of my need, I am bleeding rather profusely. I <laughs> wait to, pen to penetrate the thick membrane of her concentration. I like watching her. I like to look at her because she's pretty and because I don't see her that often. She's elusive and often away on trips back to New York or Boston to meet with a publisher or to do research in a city library. When her eyes finally focus on my face, she seems not to recognize me. She still doesn't notice my bleeding finger. I know I shouldn't bother her when she's writing. The rule is that you're not to disturb her at her desk unless you are bleeding from the mouth or ears. <laughs> I hope my wounded finger qualifies. I have stabbed it with a pair of open library scissors, trying to force a cork down into a bottle of Rose's lime water with one of the long blades. My sister and I are making a concoction, a, a concoction, a witch's brew of various mixers and alcoholic liquids we've discovered in the pantry. A steady stream of blood drips, drips, forming a small pool on the parquet floor. What is it, darling? I'm bleeding. Oh, so you are. What a nuisance. Should I ask her now if she'll take me to the bathroom to clean and bandage my wound? I wait, silent. She eyes my dripping finger. You live, run along now and find a band-aid. <laughs> Apparently, my glory finger does not qualify for her undivided attention. Before she turns back to her typewriter, she throws me a vague, though friendly glance from her cerulean blue eyes. <laughs> As I type this, almost 60 years later, my right index finger, with its fine white crescent of a scar, hits the U in cerulean. <laughs> and I actually titled that section, Scar for Life. <laughs> When we lived in New York, my mother's desk was a small rectangular writing table covered with stacks of manuscripts, boxes of carbon paper, yellow legal pads on which she wrote her long hand drafts, and of course her typewriter. At the far end of our living room, beneath a window looking out on the gray shaft of 116th Street between Riverside Drive and Broadway, the utilitarian desk served its purpose as one of the tools of her trade. There, in her writing trance, she would often labor nights after work and weekends on, week on assignments she brought home from the office or the occasional freelance job. Family traffic flowed through the living room, but an invisible and permeable shield seemed to protect her from our intrusions and even our presence in the room. I now know that I was being imprinted, conditioned to what it means to be a writer and a mother, no matter how I resisted the law. And this next section is called New York, 1958, on the banks of the river Garibiano. Early on weekday mornings, my mother moves around in the kitchen in our New York apartment, two paces from my closed bedroom door. Running water and clanking plates merge with my morning dreams as she washes last night's dishes and makes coffee. When she opens my door, Chanel No. 5, laced with coffee, drifts into the room, displacing its persist persistent dank odor. I breathe in my mother's essence, my eyes still closed. Every day, she dabs a little perfume behind her ears and follows her around all day like a faint, sweet ghost. Wake up, darling, she chirps. I'll keep you at 
The fake British accent, I notice, is more crisp this morning than usual. Lately, her biscuits, petrol, and schedules annoy me. <laughs> her way of speaking never used to bother me. When one of my friends would ask, having noticed that nobody else in the family speaks with an accent, I'd shrug and say, that's just how she likes to talk. Now I find it embarrassing, find her embarrassing. She always laughs and laughs and tosses off her answer when someone inquires about her accent. Pure affectation, darling. I open my eyes, mom stands in the doorway, her office mask painted on for the day, eyebrows plucked even, bright red lipstick, perfect. She wears a beige sack dress from the clearance rack at Bloomingdale's, one of last year's latest styles touted by Harper's Bazaar, the magazine where she works as a copywriter and editor. She has to dress stylishly even though she's not in the fashion department. The skirt of the sack dress is so narrow that she has to take very short steps, like a geisha girl. <laughs> she sticks her head in the door when she's about to leave to take my sister to her bus stop before going to work. She gives me instructions. Please tidy up the parlor when you come home. Julieta is coming over tonight. Julieta is the author of a memoir called The Child Across the River that my mother is translating from Italian into English. She lived in Italy for several years when she was a young girl and learned to speak fluent Italian. Now it comes in handy to make extra money. So as not to bust her lipstick, one blows a kiss off her fingertips and reminds me of one more thing. Don't wake Carlton, he's had a dreadful night, poor darling. Don't turn your radio on or he'll have a nervous breakdown. Carlton, my stepfather, has bad nerves and insomnia. He stays up all night smoking, drinking bourbon, and writing his novel. I don't think he's making much progress judging from all the paper balls on the floor. Usually I don't see him until the afternoons when I get home from school. He'll be sitting in the old lane chair in the living room, still in his sour smelling pajamas, smoking a cigarette in a long black holder and clinking the ice cubes in his glass of bourbon. Lately, though, he hasn't been here much at all. Just a week ago, he was out all night and came home with a black eye and a swollen lip. After my mother and sister leave, I turn on the radio to hear the teddy bear singing to know, no, no means to love, love, love. <laughs> when I get home from school, there's no sign of Carlton. Relieved that I don't, I'm relieved that I don't have to clean up the living room around him. He's still not back when mom arrives home at 6 o'clock, or when Julieta comes to work on the translation. Mom puts, her on, puts on her bright face, even though I can tell she's upset. She tells my sister and me to run along now, but I linger, quietly pretending to do my math homework. She forgets all about me as she and Julieta sit together on our uncomfortable old blue silk couch with the hard scroll arms. The manuscript pages spread out on the coffee table. They speak only in Italian as they read through the manuscript of the script of the child across the river. Their fluid syllables tumble over me. I don't understand a word, but I love the music of the language. Sometimes serious, sometimes laughing and gesturing, they pour over the pages, reminding me of two schoolgirls sharing stories about their day. I'm fascinated by Giulietta D'Alessandro, this brave and pretty woman. In 1943, when the Allies invaded Italy, Giulietta was separated from her young daughter Anna for two years. Anna was visiting her grandmother across the river Garundiano, when the territory on that side of the river fell to American troops. Julieta was stranded on the German side, but climbed mountains, braved the German army, minefields, the SS, and Allied bombs, then waded and swam across the river to find her Anna. I try to picture my mother crawling under barbed wire and cold mud and frozen fields full of landmines to find her way back to me. I envision myself as Anna, who was reading in the library when Julieta finally found her. Anna looked up from her book to see her mother, arms outstretched. I imagined my own mother standing before me, arms outstretched. After Julieta leaves, my mother quickly switches into high glory gear. Her voice shakes when she calls the West End bar, where Carlton sometimes spends his afternoons. I can hear how close she is to the edge of losing control. The bartender tells her he left hours ago with some young man. My mother, the actress, sighs, shakes her head, and forces a fake little laugh. What a relief, that naughty boy. He's going to feel like the wrath of God tomorrow. Her strained cheerfulness is not convincing. If he's not home in the morning, she'll call the police like she did last night. 
She forgets to ask about my homework before sending me off to bed. From my room, I can hear faint but frantic typing. Uh, faint but frantic typing. In spite of her worry about Carlton, she is writing, probably working on the memoir. I wonder how she can switch so easily from the edge of hysterics to concentrate on the work. Maybe it helps to think about someone else's story. There's music on the photograph, Bach, the cello suites, Pablo Casals. I hate her classical music. It seeps under my door and gives me a headache. I especially hate the cello suites because when the bow meets the strings, it sounds like someone's sobbing. I feel as though I could get caught up in that sound and start to cry without knowing why or how to stop it. I don't know why, but recently I've begun to hate whatever my mother loves. Bach, opera, whole wheat bread, and dry Italian cookies that taste like dust, George Eliot. My mother gave me a copy of Mill on the Floss for my ninth birthday. I was interested to know that George Eliot was a woman who took a man's name in order to get published, but I couldn't get through the book. I tried, started to read it, but never got past page five. I finally skipped to the last chapter to discover that some girl named Maggie Tolliver drowned in a river with her brother. That thick book full of tiny prints, long words, and no pictures defeated me. These days, except for homework reading for school, I read what mom calls rubbish. I have become addicted to magazines like Modern Screen and True Confessions that I buy with my babysitting money and keep stashed under my mattress. I gravitate to all things she despises. Bologna sandwiches on under bread, chewing gum, rock and roll. To know him, know, know him is to love, love, love him, and I do. Carlton is still out when I fall asleep. I wake to an odd, faint noise, more sensation than sound, that filters through the darkness and silence of the night. The typing and music have stopped, but there is something. I get up and step into the hallway and pass into Carlton's empty office. Careful not to knock over a whiskey glass full of cigarette butts on the floor, I move toward the French doors leading to the living room. One door is ajar. I can see my mother sitting in the dark, on the couch, holding a yellow cushion on her lap. The street lights on 116th Street stream a long shaft of light across her desk, surrounding her in a pale, thin aura. She pulls the cushion up to her face, sobbing into it, the muffled sound that awakens me. I've witnessed her dramatic tantrums and the theatrical hysterics for the benefit of an audience, but I have never seen her weep like this. I watch her breaking apart, understand that her world is collapsing. She can't pretend away the catastrophe that is Carlton. I want to throw the doors open, go to her, put my arms around her. I want to keep her company, to tell her it will be all right, to rescue her from her sadness. But I'm afraid. Her mask is off. I'm afraid she would push me away and say, run along now, darling. Her grief floods the room. I can't find my way across its distance to get to her. I turn around, sneaking back in the dark to my little hole of a room, leaving her stranded. When I was very young, I vowed that I would certainly not be a writer, nor would I be like my mother as a mother. I judged her on both counts and without realizing it, declared a sentence on myself. In my determination to show her how it was done, I dropped out of college after my freshman year, married when I was still a teenager, and immediately had children. At some point in the intensity, intensity of those childbearing and raising years, I recognized the false and flimsy self-satisfaction self of assuming I was a better parent than my own mother was not enough to fill my life. I, I finished college, went to graduate school, Ironically, I specialized in George Eliot's novels <laughs> and became an English teacher, thinking that I could avoid writing. As a working mother, I was determined to stay close enough to keep an eye on my children and always be available for their small needs and major emergencies. I got used to constant interruptions and was somehow able to retrieve a lost sentence or disrupt a train of thought in my academic writing that didn't count as writing. I still prided myself, prided myself at being not my mother. Long after my children were grown and I was about to retire from teaching, I came to the realization that I was going to write, that I was, that I am, a writer. Though I had let go of my early resentment against my mother for her parental sins, I still judged her and would not commute my self-imposed sentence. I refused to call myself a writer. 
I still punished myself while blaming my mother for being herself. And now it was time to stop. I opened the gate, just a crack at first. I wrote a poem. Then I wrote some more poems. And then I wrote a book. Now another is in the works about my mother, the writer, and mother. <laughs>
She was originally married to a Russian theatrical director, Teodor Komisarchevsky, and she had two daughters, daughters and two sons. Christopher, one of her sons, was about my age, and for a long time I had a secret crush on him. Mr. Komisarchevsky died in 1954, and then Miss Dell married John Chamberlain, a conservative writer and columnist whose wife had died and whose daughters had also studied dance with Miss Dell like me. They were close friends of my mother's for many, many years, and even at the very end of my mother's life, when she was quite fragile, and Ernestine and John were not much younger or stronger, the three of them still met for tea at my mother's house in Connecticut. It was so good to see them together, old friends conversing as always, though at that time my mother did not say very much at all, and nobody knew what she was thinking. John, too, was quiet, but Ernestine filled the room with brightness and beauty and her extraordinary energy which she lavished upon all those around her. She made everything possible. At one of these meetings, one of the latest of these meetings, she turned to me affectionately and said, sharing a wonderful secret, John and I are thinking we'll take your mother to Europe. <laughs> I knew the plan was completely unrealistic, absolutely unworkable, and at that time my mother's life had begun to be a matter of work for me and for others. The schedule of her hours and her days, the caregivers who were with her now around the clock. But even then, my heart leapt with hope, a mental shut day at the very idea of the three of them, Ernestine and John and my mother, traveling freely abroad together for one lovely moment, at a time when I would not have believed it possible, Ernestine again showed me what it meant to dance. And then there were the aunts, Aunt Con and Aunt Margo, my mother's sister and sister-in-law. Aunt Con, Constance Marl Morgan, was younger than my mother and had been a brilliant student and graduated summa cum laude from Smith College, later served on the Board of Trustees, for the best chair. In, my in her diaries, my mother always referred to her younger sister in matters of knowledge, intellect, or any kind of scholarship. She told my father, just before the first time he took her flying, I think Constance ought to have this experience instead of me. She is so much more intelligent about airplanes. <laughs> Every year, my Aunt Con would travel east lived in Portland, Oregon, or outside of Portland, Oregon, east, as my mother put it, meaning New England, not Asia. She would stay with us in Connecticut for some of the time during these trips, associated with her work for Smith College. Our mothers would sit together at the end of a long day of committee meetings at Com, or struggling with a book, my mother. They talked and they sipped from glasses of amber sherry, usually Pedro de Mac, usually dry rather than sweet. If my cousin and I, my mom's daughter and I came downstairs. We could share the food, though not the sharing. There were little plates of crackers, cars, wafers, wafers or wrappers for wheat thins and triscuits, and dainty wedges of gouda cheese, or sometimes a small brown ceramic crock of spreadable wine and cheddar, which I loved. Sometimes I wonder how much cheese I ate growing up in my mother's household. The talk of children and husbands and books and work would move on into issues of higher education or current events or international affairs. Names would be invoked, perhaps President Mendenhall of Smith College or Dow Hammarskjöld of the United Nations or Democratic statesman Adlai Stevenson, whom my mother admired so much that she influenced my father to vote for Stevenson when he ran for president. My father tended to vote Republican and up to that time had never voted for a Democrat in the presidential election. However, my mother left a book of Stevenson's essays on my father's bedside table the night before the election, and he read it, then cast his vote for Stevenson in the morning. She said that after reading that book, he was convinced that the man could effectively lead the country, and I heard the story from my father himself. What it made clear to me, not for the first time or the last, was that my mother was a very powerful woman. Another titan of a friend for my mother was my Aunt Margo, who was a Buddhist. She had grown up with her sister in a family of theosophists in the Ojai Valley in California. And she and her 
husband, John Wilkie, had a home not far from my mother's. They had met because actually Margo had first been married to my mother's brother, and there was a divorce. But then they remained very close, my mother and Aunt Margo. Her apartment was full of light and beautiful furniture and paintings and books. Um, and she had a meditation room with a shrine in one small room for which I would pass feeling respectful but uneasy on the way to the bathroom. There was a cushion and a vase of flowers in front of a tapestry in the wall, on the wall, excuse me, bearing an image of the Buddha, or maybe not. It could have been Ganesh, the Hindu god with the elephant head. Margo was very fond of Ganesh, and a few years before she died, she brought me a little statue of him, which I treasure. Margo always wore bright, wet-looking lipstick, which didn't stop her from kissing everybody. <laughs> As a child, I would wear Margo's lipstick mark on my cheek, proudly, all day. She knew everybody, from New York Society leaders of all generations, to theater personalities, to spiritual leaders from around the world. Everyone was an intimate friend. An old friend of mine, also a friend of Margo's, called me once to tell me a story. The two of them had gone together to hear the Dalai Lama speaking in New York City and had just settled into their seats before the program. The Dalai Lama appeared on stage smiling, looked over the assembled crowd benevolently before beginning to speak, and then said to the audience, wait, I need to greet somebody. He left the stage, walked down the aisle to where my Aunt Marco was sitting, and embraced her affectionately before turning to go back on up the aisle and back on stage again. My friend looked over at her in awe. Margo laughed and said dismissively, Oh, it's nothing. I've known him since he was a little boy. <laughs> These were the women I knew best in my mother's life, though there were many others. I could see them all, the circles of women, and sometimes men, who surrounded her, listened to her, talked with her, strengthened her with their affection, and were privy to her thoughts over the years. They showed me who she was in a way that I would not have seen by myself, not even as her daughter. They offered me a view of her truer than a biographer's, truer, truer even than a view available to any reader of her words. Close friends do not see what readers do, or scholars do, or even as your admirers or detractors do if you have them. Close friends simply are with you in friendship moment after moment throughout a lifetime, however joyful, agonizing, or simply mundane those moments may be. I meet regularly with my own friends, including my own group of women who discuss books, another group of writers who meet once a month to share what they're working on, and a third small group that meets now and then for a drink, having started doing this with all of us had husbands with serious illnesses. In most cases, our husbands are better now, but we still meet now and then. We talk about husbands and children, and sometimes grandchildren, about work and about books. The talk is punctured with laughter and sometimes with sighs. It bears truthful, easy witness to our being here together and caring about one another. With sympathy and interest, we gather together as my mother and her friends gathered long ago. And without even knowing we are doing it, 